This is what I got for s equal to 0.99. You might notice that this result looks better than what we got earlier when we had s is equal to 0.5. Here's the result that we got earlier. Now that s is equal to 0.99, the propagating wave looks a bit more like a square pulse. But it still doesn't match what we expect physically, which is a wave that looks like a square pulse with an amplitude of 1 propagating away from the source. So let's return to the numerical dispersion relation. Last time we assumed k tilde is a real number, and we analyzed the form of the equation for omega tilde. This allowed us to solve for the current stability factor s, and find what we need to set s equal to in order to keep the simulation stable. Now let's assume we will run our code in a stable regime, meaning omega will be a real number. Let's also say omega tilde is equal to the physical tilde. What is left to understand is the numerical wave number, k tilde. What is k tilde equal to, and is it ever a complex number? We care about this because the physical wave number is always a real number. Here is table 7-1 again. k is equal to beta. We often use k for lossless materials and beta is more commonly used for lossy materials. You can see in the third column of the second row here that for a lossless medium, k, or beta, is a real number. So then, to figure out if the numerical wave number is ever complex, let's rearrange the numerical dispersion relation to solve for k tilde. Then we will analyze the form of the equation and see if there are scenarios in which the numerical wave number might be complex. After rearranging the numerical dispersion relation to solve for the numerical wave number, we get what's shown here. Looking at this equation, we can see that k tilde can be a complex number if the quantity in the brackets is greater than 1. So let's take a, st a step back for a moment. What does it mean to have a complex wave number? To allow the, comp the k tilde to have an imaginary part? Well, if we take the solution for the electric field of our plane wave, we had e z i, e z naught, e to the j, omega tilde, n delta t minus k tilde, i delta x. If k here, that's an i, if k here is complex, then the second part of the exponential term has both a real and an imaginary part. So that means the contribution from this will be e to the minus j k tilde, real i delta x and we can write out as a separate exponential e to the minus j j k imaginary i delta x so i'm writing k tilde as being k the real part plus j the imaginary part the first term here describes the phase of the wave as it would be physically. But look at the second term. If we multiply j times j, we're going to get minus 1. And then in the exponent, we get a real number. We get e to the k tilde imaginary i delta x. So what this means is that k imaginary will cause a change in the amplitude of the propagating wave, and this is non-physical. So we definitely don't want our solution to be in this regime where k tilde is allowed to be a complex number. So to help make sure we don't ever run our code in this regime where k tilde is complex, let's figure out when the transition occurs between the wave number being real versus complex. To do this, we need to look at our expression here for the numerical wave number. Looking at this expression, we can see that k tilde transitions to a complex number when the argument of the arc sign is equal to 1. So that's at the transition point from a real to a complex k tilde. Now we just defined the current stability limit. We said c delta t over delta x is equal to s. So we might recognize this first term here as being 1 over s. 
Since we know how to set s to keep the simulation stable, let's also see if we can write the argument of the sine in terms of s. Delta t here shows up in the argument of the sine. So let's solve this uh, current stability limit in terms of delta t. Delta t is equal to s delta x over c. So putting all this together, in the argument here, we can write this as omega delta x over 2c times s. Since s is determined based on the current stability limit and c is just a constant, what's left in the argument is omega and delta x. So let me write what is in the brackets here. We have 1 over s times sine mega delta x over 2c times s. And we are calculating the transition point, which is where this is equal to 1. So now that we just have delta x, we should be able to use this equation to find something useful about delta x. First, we can move s here to the other side. And then we can take the arc sine of both sides. Then we have omega delta x over 2 c s transition point is equal to the arc sine of s. Then we can divide both sides by s to move that over. So then we have omega delta x over 2 c, the transition point is the arc sine of s over s. Now let's try to simplify the left side of this equation. We can use omega is 2 pi f and also c is equal to a lambda f. Then the left hand side is just equal to pi delta x over lambda. So that's equal to the inverse sine of s over s. So then if we move delta, or sorry, pi here to the other side, we get delta x over lambda is sine minus 1 of s over s pi. All right, let's take a step back and examine the term we are left with on the left side of this equation. I see a ratio that involves delta x, the size of each grid cell, and also the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave propagating in the grid. These terms on the left side make me think of the electrical size of a grid cell. In electromagnetics, what is often more important than the actual size of something in meters is the electrical size of it. The electrical size of, for example, one grid cell describes the size of the grid cell relative to a wavelength. So this means the quantity we're probably most interested in here in this equation is not just delta x, which is in units of meters, but lambda over delta x, which is the number of grid cells we have in our model per wavelength. I'm going to define this as being n, capital N, sub lambda. That's a variable we're going to use to describe the number of cells per wavelength. So now if we just reverse the order of the numerator and the denominator on both sides of our equations, we can write we have lambda over delta x, which is equal to n lambda, and that's equal to pi s over inverse sine, oh, sorry, arc sine of s. So let's say we're setting s is equal to 1. 1 is just a nice even number. We're at the current stability limit. Then n lambda, uh, and this is the transition lambda, n lambda, that's equal to pi times 1, so I'll say if s is equal to 1, then n lambda at the transition point is equal to pi times 1 times the arc sine of 1, which is pi over pi over 2, which is equal to 2. So this means to make sure the numerical wave number is real, a real number, we need at least two grid cells per wavelength. But do we only care about keeping the numerical wave number a real number? Is this good enough to obtain an engineering good enough solution? 
if we have two grid cells per wavelength. Let's figure out how good our solution is if we choose an n lambda close to, but above this transition point. Let's say we will choose n lambda so it'll be greater than two. So in that case, our expression for k tilde, we get just a real number because we have it at the enough grid cells per wavelength to keep it a real number. And we get what's shown here. On the left side of the slide here, I've written the numerical wave number in terms of s and n lambda. Since k tilde is a real number, the wave will not change in amplitude as it propagates. What about the speed of the wave? Here is table 7-1 again. The phase velocity here is equal to omega over beta. So we're writing phase velocity as v, and I'll say v sub p, and we're, the numerical wave velocity is omega, and I could say beta, but we're, we'd, we'd be using k for free space, so k tilde and the real part because we only have a real part, we're in the real part regime. So plugging in the expression we have for k, the real part of k, into our phase velocity equation, we're going to get, for the numerical phase velocity, we're going to get 2 pi f, I'm writing out omega, and we're going to get 2 over delta x, inver uh, arc sine, uh, 1 over s sine pi s, and lambda. And we can simplify this expression by canceling the twos. Uh, we can write f as c over lambda, and we can plug in n lambda here in the denominator in place of delta x over lambda. And if we do all that, we obtain an expression for the numerical phase velocity of the electromagnetic wave propagating in the 1D grid. So here it is after simplifying from the previous page. So now, while setting s is equal to 1, we can plug in some numbers for n lambda to see if the numerical phase velocity is equal to c. Here is c. I've written out c. This is in meters per second. So c is the actual speed of the wave in free space. Let's start by setting n lambda to a value just above the threshold. Let's say n lambda is equal to 3. If we plug in s is equal to 1 and n lambda equal to 3 into this equation here, for the phase velocity, numerical phase velocity, we're going to get 2.9784056 E8 meters per second. So that is slower than the speed of light. And if n lambda is equal to 10, then the numerical phase velocity is 2.9960309 E8. And if n lambda is equal to, say, 1,000, the numerical phase velocity is 2.9979246. I'm losing track of my decimal places. So let's just uh, end it there. Meters per second. So you can see that as we increase n lambda, the electromagnetic waves that propagate in our 1D grid will propagate at speeds closer and closer to the speed of light. So how can we choose an n lambda? Should we just choose values of 100 or 1,000 so we get a really good match with the real phase velocity?